Hey, welcome everybody. So we're at uh, our, uh, it's kind of a makeshift laboratory uh, in Mount Dora, Florida, uh, Dreiss Cleaning Systems. Uh, <clears throat> we got a pretty special project here that we're excited about. Uh, Matt Mormon's uh, E36 Obsessive Garage project. And this car came to us through Tommy F. Yeah. Um, he contacted me a few months ago because we consult and show people how to set up the Dreiss equipment. Uh, to clean cars, which has been around for maybe 15 years, technically, for cars. And um, it's just been a little bit un behind the curtain, uh, no, no theater anywhere that you could find. <clears throat> and so when Tommy found out about us, we decided to, to go ahead and clean his, his skyline. So in that process, he had Matt do the surface of the skyline, the top sides. And so Matt decided, hey, <clears throat> let's do the let's do the E36. So what we're going to do is a, is kind of an extended uh, exposure, and, and just totally lift the veil on dry ice cleaning as it pertains to cars and motorized vehicles. And that's a space that I've spent. Oh, I mean, I've been a gearhead since I was six, but in the business for 40 years. So. I don't want to think about all the times that I, and you probably did too, worked at trying to, to make something really presentable for my own gratification or because I was going to sell it and I want to make it look nice. So the idea for the benefit of Matt is to take this car to another level like he does in so many ways on the top side, interiors, we're going to go crazy on the underside. And in the process, we're going to describe the equipment. We're going to talk about the fails and, and the wins that I've had. I've done about a, no, 75 cars in the last two years. And we'll talk about why that is just now evolving. It is pretty strange that we're all just kind of figuring this out, that we could do this high level detail on really tough things to clean without abrasion or touching it and not using water because like since you were probably five or six or had consciousness, you associated cleaning with water. And we haven't used water in this shop for two years. So uh, really stoked uh, to get this thing up in the air and kind of go through it and show you some of the things that are danger points because we don't want to ruin anything. And I know Matt's going to replace a lot of parts. Um, I'm still going to clean them because I got the same disease he has. Um, and, uh, we're just gonna have a lot of fun and we want you to come along with us and it's going to be, it's going to be an eye opener. You're going to be like, finally, someone explains how this actually works and what to do. And Hey, if you want to clean your car or have it cleaned or get in the business, you're going to, you're going to know enough by the time we're done, you're going to, you're going to get it. So, uh, we're going to, we're going to jump right in. First thing I really want to do is, is to get the car on the lift and, and explain a little bit about that. So. Um, yeah, just follow us all the way through the process. Don't, don't give up on us. Um, you know, I might be a little boring and lame here or there, but just hang in there and I'll try to keep working and, uh, I'll offset my, uh, as somebody's already commented on one of Tommy's video, uh, the dry ice dude has got a weird vibe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what? All right. So I, I have gotten some criticism. We, we've set up about 20 guys in the business so far in the last two years. I've gotten some criticism about my lift and uh, we're gonna go ahead and get the car in the lift but I wanna explain something real briefly to you. This lift is an asymmetrical lift so as you see um, when I get the car up, it, an asymmetrical lift will, will position the car further back on the uprights and this is an extra wide lift and extra high because I gotta get under it and so the width and the moving the car back on the lift gives me the ability to open the doors and not put dents in them and clean the jams while I'm doing the job. So it's a little bit of an eccentric overkill, but it's, it's, it's cool for me. And so I, as I created all this as a makeshift setup, uh, you're going to laugh at a few things like, how come this lift isn't hardwired? Well, because I sold this building and we're moving to another place and like, well, I just use this drop cord. And so that's why you see me plugging my lift in, which probably nobody else does. And yes, it is 220. 
And yes, I do have a plug for 220 to plug it in. So we already took the time to position the car where it needs to be. Everybody makes fun of me because I do stuff so manually. I don't have an impact gun. Matt's going to kill me for that. But I like to do stuff manually. Hi. I'm sorry, Matt. I don't like this. This tire shine stuff. I'm a dry tire guy. I like to clean with the dry ice the tires so they're perfectly dry. Okay. We're coming up. So I took the liberty of watching Matt's walk around and he got under this car and talked a little bit about some of the things he's gonna do. And uh, I'm always cognizant of listening to my clients. And I picked up on, he's not really jacked up about this factory, <laughs> factory paper sticker. Um, he, he, you know, I, everybody's got their own thing and being respectful to what they want is important. So, you know, some of these things that we spend a, an insane amount of time trying to pre preserve and protect, like, you know, a little ink mark or a, a factory sticker or something like that, that's, that's not the kind of owner that Matt is. And a lot of the stuff he's going to replace and customize to some degree. So I don't have to, it's, it's a little easier for me, it saves the client money if you're doing work for him because you don't have to protect all that stuff. But what I see under here is going to be awesome. I mean, we're going to see some before and after stuff, and, and you're going to experience the full force of what we call Dryce. We trademark Dryce, D-R-Y-C-E, as it pertains to cleaning cars. And one of my favorites, I was like freaked out a little bit because he, he, he took the wheels off the other day, and he took them outside to clean them. I'm like, dude, it's like, what? What are you cleaning the wheels for? That's my thing. I get to, oh, that's one of my favorite things to show people. But the good news is I heard him say you're gonna take the wheel weights off, which they did. But guess what's left? Guess what's still there on the wheel weights? The adhesive. Like you, you have probably tried to take adhesive off the wheels. We're gonna blow that stuff off like butter, which is fun. Uh, all of this plastic stuff is really kind of fun to do, but but also dangerous because, you know, plastic has a code on it and, it, you know, it's different compositions even on the same car. So you, you do have to be a little careful and trial what happens on your settings and your distance and your motion to make sure that you're not giving the plastic a different texture. And that can happen. Sometimes you can use it to your advantage in your favor, which I have done, but what I'm saying is, uh, it's not a magic wand. It's not flawless and perfect. You can screw stuff up. That's the whole purpose of what we've done in the last couple of years is to try to minimize the risk of using those old industrial machines that have too aggressive of a application. Uh, the, the dry ice is non-abrasive, but at a certain level of a soft item, like the kiss of death is foam. Like this thing will eat foam instantaneously. So we got to be careful of foam. If the customer is concerned about stickers, we got to be careful about stickers. Um, we got to watch, um, you know, a lot of the things that you typically wouldn't have to worry about, you got to watch out for and be careful. And, and then once you've done some cars, you know what to watch out for and how to minimize the risk. But uh, yeah, it's not, it's not like wave the wand like a pressure washer and you're done. And anybody can do it. It's, uh, it's artistic. It's almost like reverse painting. So like you'll see me, I'll make a pass and I'll flip the gun and flip it at the end because if you concentrate at one point too long, you're gonna make uh, an impression on that or clean that differently than the rest of it. And that's so what I see a lot of the guys online that are starting to do this. You know, they're just making passes like this and then like this and you know, I, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. You know, you don't plant cornrows dissimilar angles. You, you gotta have a flow. You know, you don't paint a car by going this way, this way, this way. You, you have to have a flow to get a consistent look. So that's something you really gotta be careful of. But uh, what I see here, and, and there's a couple things I really love, like this fabric stuff, it, 
we've been able to clean that largely. He might replace this, but, but we're going we're gonna to take a shot at seeing if we can clean this or make it look better. Uh, we've done hood liners, but what I see under here is awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun shooting this. Okay, now this is, this is a really big deal. On BMWs especially, there's a couple of danger spots with BMWs. Uh, I can't explain why, I don't know, but just from experience, the underhood colored paint is very touchy and frail. So you'll see when we get in there, we're really careful and, and have a method and a distance that's in, important. The other side uh, or other part of a BMW that's almost constantly trashed, tortured, or at least affected negatively are these aluminum or padded aluminum in some cases exhaust shields. These are pretty decent, they're pretty thick, uh, but you can get into a situation where if you have the settings too high or you're using an old industrial machine, you'll clean it and it'll look awesome. It'll be bright silver, it's like brand new, except for it's like got uh, a miniature hail damage experience from the bottom. And so it's just peppered. And, and, and then the other side of it is that when you get in these tire wells, almost all the cars, especially the German cars and Japanese cars, these tire wells, you know, these cars are sprayed or painted depending on the color, like this car is gonna have on the rock, inside the rocker panels, on this backside, we'll probably see it too. They have a combination of the color of the car, some metallic that's drifted in from the robot, and uh, black. Some of the cars have black on areas where you'd see them standing, looking at the car, so the factory puts black on them. We don't wanna change any of that, and if you're not careful, your pattern and your method of cleaning will remove some of it or create a real blotchy look. Like I've seen guys clean cars with dry ice and they post the pictures on Instagram like, yeah, look what I did. And I look at it and I'm like, oh, it ruined the car. It's like someone brings you a car and it's dull and, and you have them buff it out and it looks awesome, except for the three places that they burn through the paint. So yeah, you can clean the bottom of a car and it can be better, but you can also ruin it eternally uh, to the point where unless you replace those parts or if it's a finish, you got to refinish it, which, you know, that sucks. And so those are some of the things that we're trying to address. Uh, my, one of my favorite things to do in BMWs are these tanks. The tanks are going to come out awesome. Here's a big thing. If someone has cleaned the Cosmoline. There's a whole other subject we'll talk about later. If someone's cleaned the Cosmoline off of a car or any surface, and then they bring it to you or they want to get it dry ice cleaned, it's not going to come as clean as if the Cosmoline was on there and I took it off first pass. So think about this. The car's brand new and they spray Cosmoline on it. That means the surface was spotless, perfect, clean, and then had a coating put on it. So when I take that coating off, it's spotless, perfect, clean underneath. Well, if there are areas like right here, there's no Cosmoline. With Cosmoline, it's spattered in there, and I clean that. It could look dissimilar. There might be a different look to it because some of it had Cosmoline and some didn't. And so there are tricks that we'll talk about on how we can address that, and it's it's always related to client interaction. So I'm going to end this spot with, I can't express enough how important it is to understand your client and what they want. They own the car. They do what they want with it. Matt's got his own opinion about what he wants to do with these things. Some people freak out when we take Cosmoline off. But the reality is that, you know, when you see new cars being delivered to the dealership today, they have that white plastic on them to protect the outside of the paint. So if it's wrong to remove Cosmoline from a car, I've ruined the value or devalued it because it, I took an original finish off. I guess in 50 years, we'll see GT3 RSs on Pebble Beach lawn with the white plastic on them. I don't think so. They put that Cosmoline on there to protect those cars as they came over the ocean and the first few years of being driven. These cars aren't going to be driven the way they were when they were brand new. They were building cars. No, the manufacturers now do, but 20, 30 years ago, 
you know, the Radwood and the Young Timer and 50s, they're just building cars. They're not building collector cars. They're not making and creating collector cars. So uh, look forward to getting into all this. It's going to be cool. All right. I, I would say probably, aside from the number one question, the number one question in dry ice cleaning is, where's the dirt go? <laughs> That's what everybody wants to know. Because, you know, it's a, it's a process that we'll get over when I get to the material, you'll see. The dry ice sublimates to a gas. It's basically when you're propelling it and it's hitting a substrate or surface, that dry ice is converting from a solid form of CO2 to a gas form of CO2. So there's, even though the word ice is in the name, there's no moisture. There's no water. The only water issue we have is potentially right there in these crazy compressors. So people want to know what does it really cost you know how do you set the system up uh, god bless the manufacturers that make the dry ice blasters i don't like to use the term blaster because blaster is like do i want to take some guy's six seven figure car and blast it uh, i like to dry ice clean it that's our term for it so um yeah it takes some it's just you know buying the machine is enough it's you know 45 grand for just the machine when well, you got to have the compressed air solution to go with it so when i bought my machine when they first came out with that particular unit nobody really knows so no offense to the machine manufacturers but they don't they usually go to an industrial plant to demonstrate the machine they plug it into an airline that some guy in the back corner is responsible for some 300 horsepower compressor and they just go to town demo on the machine. So they don't really have that much experience um, with what you need to actually do this work compressing the air. So, so I learned a lot of mm, five figure, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar lessons in this process. It took me about six months to get it halfway right. So this is like an abomination. Uh, the next generation when we move, which is really cool because we sold this building and July 1st we got some cool news coming out, some collaboration stuff that you're going to like. Um, so this has like got me by for two years, but it's like the wrong way to go. So let's talk about the fail of it all. So this space uh, I've had for 16 years, single phase power. You can't get a U.S. compressor company to make a 40 or 30 horse compressor that's single phase because they're really inefficient and bad and i was uh, i didn't want to because i knew i sold the building i didn't want to run three phase and spend 10 grand to get three phase power here knowing i'm leaving so the only company is this not to be purchased not advised to buy a uh, compressor made in china that's 30 horsepower 220 volt, but single phase. Uh, I was not really thrilled with it when I got it, but it works. So the bottom line is you cannot do this work at the highest level without a 40 horse compressor. Don't kid yourself that a 25 or 30 will get you by. And if you're selling a dry ice machine, you're a salesperson, is it in your best interest to convince someone that they need a big compressor or a little compressor? Well, the reality is you got to have 40 horsepower and here's why so this is our compressor so let's just presume i did the right thing i didn't learn the hard way let's say this is a 40 horse compressor so coming out of the compressor i got a one inch line all the compressed air guys say yeah that's that's plenty yeah that's no problem well it's not it needs to be bigger because you know volume is critical and if you don't have a big enough hose i don't care if you have a hundred horse compressor here if you got a small hose, you can't get the volume to the end of the run here. So first tank we call a wet tank. So this is first line of defense for moisture. When you're pulling in ambient air and compressing it, it gets hot. And as it leaves a compressor, it condenses just like a glass of iced tea. And so nice. So now we have condensation your all your compressors you deal with this so we have a drain down here and i got this makeshift homemade container where i crack the valve and let the water you know they have these awesome little solenoid deals that i could have put on the bottom but i told you it's a makeshift matt will go crazy he won't like this part at all but this is just you know i was getting by in my farm days in iowa we call this the rube goldberg setup 
All right, so this is my first line of defense, filtering the oil out of the air. And then we come over here to my first effort that I thought was the bomb, right? A refrigerated dryer. So you all are thinking about doing this and you might have a compressor and you probably have a refrigerated dryer. You think, oh yeah, I, I got the dryer covered, I'm good. Well, you don't, and here's why. A refrigerated dryer, just like a refrigerator or your air conditioner, you know, you can't turn the air conditioner in your car down to 10 below zero. There's a limitation of refrigeration, okay? So a 35 year compressed air guy, after I learned a crap load about this, told me that 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 44% relative humidity is the highest points that a refrigerated dryer can be relied upon to get all of the moisture out of that compressed air. This is Florida, central Florida. How many days, not today, how many days is it 74 degrees or lower, 44% humidity or lower? Maybe 10. So that was a fail. This is a $4,000 fail. But this is only a $4,000 fail after I bought the sister US air compressor refrigerated dryer that came that had the free online cut, brand new. So I, hey, you gotta replace this guy. So they sent me another one and it was cut. So I said, forget that, bought this. So I'm going to town. I got my new dryer, like I'm excited, you know, no longer am I gonna have water flying out of the end of the nozzle like I was dealing with initially. And that's critical and you'll find out why in a little bit. So fired it up still have water. I don't get it. So I learned from the guy, refrigerator dryer ain't going to cut it. So that's there now. It's an anchor for me. It's, it's not doing anything. I, it, I don't turn it on. This is the bad mamma jamma here. So when you get those packages in the mail and you open them up and they got those little packets in them, they either say silica or desiccant. This is filled with desiccant. So each chamber has desiccant in it, little beads and the air is routed down below and the air is forced to go through these beads that are very absorbent and they capture the moisture. When this cylinder gets full, then the system knows it, it switches over and runs through this cylinder. So they alternate back and forth and back and forth. So you might say, okay, great. Once it's full of water, how does it get dry? How does it, how do you, if you come back to it, it's still wet. No, because it takes a little bit of compressed air and dries this cylinder out. So while this is being used for my work, this is being dried. So what does that mean? Well, that means you're stealing a little compressed air volume from your system. That's why you have to have a 40 horse compressor. You gotta have excess, just like on you know, flywheel horsepower versus rear wheel horsepower, there's a difference. So you gotta have extra. So now we've got filters on this system and then we come to the dry tank. Two purposes here. A dry tank, actually three, is a way to always confirm and check that you don't have any moisture in your system. There should never be water coming out of the bottom of this tank, ever. Surge. When I pull the trigger on that machine and it's set at 120 PSI and high volume, it's gonna pull a massive amount of air from this space Instead of, if I didn't have this, it would pull it from one of these chambers and it would disrupt the desiccant constantly. And it's not good for the desiccant dryer. So this is a protection piece to not mess up the desiccant dryer. And then lastly, we have a, a valve to regulate specifically the pressure that we want, because we don't want more in this particular machine, we don't want more than 125 PSI going into this machine. All right, so now, if we've done everything right, We've got 125 or more CFM, cubic feet per minute, and we have up to 125 PSI. And it is so dry that, uh, well, you'll see, because we'll have some ambient moisture issues and you'll see that. And I'll shut the dry ice off and you'll see how fast this thing dries, like a, a leaf blower or that stuff you can buy to blow your car off after you wash it. It doesn't hold a candle to the volume of air that we have that's super dry and we'll dry off the surface you need. So now let's get into the beast. So this particular machine is, um, is kind of a legend already in two years. 
it is a PCS60 in that it's particle control system. So we put 60 pounds of dry ice in here. So here's the hopper and you can see this little feeder wheel. Once the dry ice goes down into this bin and that feeder wheel feeds it to the cutter, you can choose the size of particle that you want to shoot on the car and you're going to find out why that's so critical. So having the ability at minimum to have a 0.3, 4, or 5 size particle or uh, a 2.5 or 3 size particle, uh, they're used in different ways, they have different risks and benefits. And that, that was the part that got me over the hump to get into this business after watching it for 13 years. So that's the beast. This is the 45 plus or minus thousand, depending on who you talk to, $45,000 beast. Now, we put a packing blanket in here. When you get this 500 pounds of dry ice, it comes with two pieces of cardboard on top. And then they put this blue liner in it. And this seems like a really dumb thing, but after messing with these things for two years, how you manage it is you roll this up, you kind of tuck it in here. And there's a reason for all this. You tuck this down here, and like this is the this is what you don't want. I ripped the bla the plastic bag, which means that if you have a tendency to do that and you're scooping ice out of here and you're putting it in the machine, is it a good thing to have the plastic end up in the machine? It's not a good thing. So that's that's an issue. So we try to keep this completely apart. And here's one of my little tricks. I got to be the only guy in Florida with a mountain pick. Although this is Mount Dora. <laughs> what the heck? So this this is a bad mamma jamma. So if you don't have this, this stuff comes pretty hard. So see see what happens here. As it sits, it's sublimating all the time. People say, well, how long will this last? It doesn't melt, number one. It does not melt. It sublimates. This is what sublimation looks like. This is 108 negative. So I'm going to throw this on the floor, and you're going to watch it just disappear. So that's converted to a gas. So it went from a solid to a gas and just evaporated. That process, each one of these pellets, this pellet, when it sublimates, all right, that will take up the space of 800 units. So whatever this is or whatever this bin is, if you sublimated all of this bin instantly, it would take up 800 times the space. That's why these are never sealed. You don't put a strap on this and seal it off thinking you're preserving the dry ice, it's gonna blow up. So that's where you get the dry ice bombs on the internet. So the bottom line is, this stuff will last two weeks. Some of it will last two weeks. So if you start with a 500 pound bin, it'll probably get delivered at 450 or 500 ish. And every day, this thing is going to drop, drop, drop. And it doesn't drop like water. It, it see, see what happens here? It sublimates from, from all six sides. So if you just left this closed and you came back in two weeks, there'd be about that much dry ice at the bottom and the rest of it would have sublimated into the space. So as it does that, it gets chunky and hard and you gotta break it up. And we go both ways and I always bring it to the center. And then I'll take my feed scoops any, and I just go together. And I got my bins ready so I can start filling the bin. This is a very efficient and best way to do it. Now, once you're done and you've got your hopper filled, just fold this in, in, in. So this is 500 pounds, it's on wheels. We use air gas, we recommend everybody use air gas. We have a relationship with them, we can help you with that. But the bottom line is, that 500 pounds, people say, how much dry ice does it take to do a car? Well, how much soap do you use? <laughs> versus how much soap do I use? Versus how much soap somebody else uses? Hey, it's every, everybody's gonna do it differently. And, and you know, I might go through a whole bin to do the same place that you use a half a bin. Maybe mine looks better, maybe it looks worse. I can't say. But the reality is that it's just as unique as everything else in life. There's no 
cut and dried scenario where it, you're always going to use the same amount to do a car. Because what does it mean to do a car? Well, what if the guy says, I only want you to do the underbody? Well, I'll do the wheel wells too. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to not do the whole car like this. This is what I live for right here. <sighs> I mean, this is going to, I hate to say this because sometimes it, it does prove me wrong, but like that's going to go whew, and be gone in a whiff. Some stuff like that is nirvana. It's so fun. But as far as the equipment goes, let me get to the nuts and bolts about money because you want to know that too. I overpaid for most of my stuff. But a full compressed air solution, properly sized and installed, is plus or minus, depending on where you are, 30 grand. You can ping me and tell me I got one for 25 or 27 or 22, or I bought it. You know, I'm just telling you, whether it's Atlas Copco, Kaiser, uh, Cell Air, uh, whatever you want to pick, Quincy, it, the proper setup, which will look a lot better than this with the, all the catchment for the condensation and the oil water separator so your EPA doesn't yell at you for putting oil, oily water outside, that's gonna cost you 30 grand. So some quick math here, 45, 30, 75, six, 81, and we haven't gotten to the little frilly things that are necessary, they're important. And you haven't built a website yet, you haven't done all kinds of other things. You're gonna spend 100 grand to do this at this level startup and if you think you're going to do it for 100 grand uh and you're questioning it stay tuned matt and i are working on something pretty cool okay back to uh the e36 project at hand <clears throat> so this is like an oil absorbent cloth that's pretty easy we used it in the marine oil recovery issue in water so we like to use this to stuff down in the engine bay because if you think about it if i'm down there with crazy PSI and volume of air and I'm blowing dirt dirt's going somewhere so you know I, I want to make sure that we're uh, not running all the dirt up in the hood liner and getting it all over here as best we can so we like to just tuck this away it's kind of one of our little we learned this lesson the hard way deals you just make a lot more work for yourself if you don't do this. And then in just a minute, we'll, uh, we'll do another thing that everybody will laugh at me about because I'm old school. Um, I want to take the wheels off. I got my crazy wheel remover tool and the lug nuts I do manually. I don't have a Milwaukee tool or anything like that because I never wanted to screw up and strip out a thread or anything. So, so we'll finish this up and kind of pack this in and make sure we got any areas we can see the ground. And then I'll take a packing blanket and we'll cover that up and carefully close the hood. So a little sacrificial cloth here. Down, make sure there's nothing. Any trouble here? Okay, there we go. All right, so here I am, old school. Ah. Take them loose. And then I got a little surprise for you after I loosen all these up. We'll bring the car up in the air a little. And you can see my toy. It's so nice to not have to worry about where the wheel is going. And I'm not going to drop it. And I got a place to put my lug nuts or my studs. And my back is not broke. Just come up a little more. Oh, is that nice? Oh, so nice. Got a little thing on there. Drop this down. It feels a little unfair, actually.
and there we go. So he's got all four wheels off. We're gonna go ahead and get the adhesive. One of my favorite things to do is to remove the hard to get areas of the dirt in the wheel and to get the adhesive off from the wheel weights. So that's a, that's a pretty cool thing to watch. So turn the valve on. We got enough pressure here. Now we turn the desiccant dryer on. And pull some ice out. So we're gonna do this wheel. And because it's pretty humid out, you're probably gonna see some moisture on the wheel. Those of you that are in New Mexico and Arizona, you won't have that trouble. So let me explain why that happens. <clears throat> you might be able to see on the inside of this lid condensation. So when I start spraying dry ice to clean a space, that overspray as that gas, the dry ice converts to a gas, sublimates in the area around me. Well, that's a cold gas and that will condense on the wheel just like a glass of iced tea as I said earlier. So there's two kinds of guns. This particular machine has, I shut the light off, a precision gun and then we have a larger production gun. What's going to happen first is the condensation is going to come out from the last time I used the gun. Just running everywhere. So that's because the cold air, when I stopped using it, condenses inside the hose. So we just keep running this out until it's not dripping and we have that dry air. All right, so there's an interesting aspect to this particular machine. When you pull the trigger, when I set my dry ice to come out, it's not immediately going to show. So watch. There it came out. So when I let off, it doesn't actually stop when I let off the trigger because it's got to purge the line first. You don't want that dry ice to sit in the line so that when you pull the trigger again, it's all jammed up in there. So you gotta allow for that. So if you're working in an area and you let go of the trigger and you don't pay attention to where your gun is, that, that can be dangerous. So we're gonna go ahead and do this wheel now and take this adhesive off. All right, so here's the nemesis. It's the adhesive on the wheel. So let's see what we got here. So that's not fast enough to suit me, so I'm going to change some adjustments in the settings. All right. So what you're seeing is we don't want to concentrate on one spot too long and risk that we pull paint off or have damage to the surface. And also moving the gun constantly prevents us from having an issue where we're super cooling an area too much. So it's oddly so that when you move off of a surface, this is 108 degrees negative. So when you move away, the ambient air warms that subject up and it starts to re re it loses its retention. And so this constant on and off can be very beneficial. So we're gonna go in here and do a spot that's got some bright white. Make sure you can see that. All right, let's go for that. So you see that went a little easier. That's when someone says, hey, how long do you think it'll take to clean my car? Well, you just saw two identical looking spots.
stickers or adhesive pads. One came off in three seconds and the other took me about 30 seconds. So you just don't know. So let's go ahead and see what we can do with the inside of the wheel here. So I'm gonna turn my settings a little different. And let's see if we can get inside these cracks. So there's some spots on this wheel after the guys cleaned them, like on the cracks and the deep crevices. So let's, this is what, uh, I was kind of hoping they wouldn't clean the wheels when they brought them, but I get it. So there's a direct relationship to the strength of the cleaning if you're perpendicular or at an angle. So if you're trying to clean at an angle, it's not as effective as if you're perpendicular. So sometimes you actually use that to your favor. You want it to be at an angle because you don't want to be that aggressive, but other times you want to be dead on. So, But you'll notice throughout this entire series, you're going to see me moving this wand all the time. I don't ever want to let that wand sit in one place and risk the damage to whatever I'm cleaning. All right, so I'm gonna turn this wheel, take me just a minute, and then uh, there's a spot of adhesive next to a brand new wheel weight. So I wanna show you what's important about that. Okay, so we got a little dirt here. We have a brand new wheel weight. We have some adhesive right next to it. So this is where the precision gun really pays off. I don't want to take a risk and affect this. So I'm going to actually shoot perpendicular and this way to not affect that wheel weight. So this is just me being obsessive. Uh, I'm a dry tire guy, and I couldn't resist cleaning a little bit of grease from mounting the tire on the wheel off and trying to give the tire a consistent rubber, brand new rubber look. So um, what we would typically do now is we'll take a little cleaner of your choice and a white eraser and just do a wipe down very lightly with a white eraser to get any film. It's like if it had cosmoline on it, like I had said previously, and the cosmoline was put on brand new, you take the cosmoline off, it's clean, perfectly clean underneath. If there's dirt on, like if you got this wheel dirty and then I cleaned it, it'd still have a little film, like when you pressure wash your chrome wheels. They're clean, but until you actually touch the wheel physically and get that final film off, we have to do that too. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this around and take a look at the front side and see if uh, see if anything was missed. Mike, can you see, can we get in the lug nuts good? Yeah, give me a second here. So what you see here, this moisture is from me not using the gun enough to keep it frosted. So it's just thawing out. It's just cold on the surface. So we're gonna go ahead and see what we can do about tidying up 
these little holes here. I got to look at it, make sure there's no paint degradation that I could blow the paint off. I want to inspect them close and look at them first. And then uh, I completely respect Matt or whomever uh, may or may not like the dry tire look, but I'm going to put the dry tire look on here and see what they think. All right, so I don't want to go all CSI Mount Dora on you. <clears throat> you know when they see uh, a series of gunshots that they're trying to track the trajectory of, they'll put a stick, you know, from whatever angle the gunshot came from. If you're trying to clean something on all surfaces, you got to move this gun around. You can't just point it straight and expect that it's going to work. So that's why you'll see me some odd gestures, and that's why a small gun is my preferred tool. The bigger the gun, the bigger the hose, the harder it is to manipulate everything and get those angles to get that dirt. One of my favorite things is, like you you wash a wheel, you spray it, you foam it, you wash it, and you blow it, and you wipe it down, and you're like, oh, I missed a spot. When we miss a spot, we go like this. Oh, I missed a spot. and we're done. There's no water spots, we don't clean anything up, there's no big deal. It's pretty fun. All right, let's, uh, let's crank this up and do some tire work. So in this particular machine, we have three things that we can control, and virtually all dry ice machines have two. This particular machine has three. We have size of particle, volume of dry ice, pounds per minute, and pressure of the air. So those are the three things that I manipulate. <clears throat> Often I'm cleaning something and it looks clean and I'll just go around it like I did because you'd be shocked how many times while you're cleaning you see something disappear that you didn't notice. So I just like that. I'm already there. I'm already set up. I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot and just go a full work around. And, and I just, I love this completely clean tire look. It's, I've never been able to achieve that. It's about, as I mentioned, I think before, it's like reverse painting. You could actually blend the look of surfaces with the gun just by distance and control and variations of movement. All right, so we're gonna knock out this adhesive here and then we're gonna spin it around and clean half of the tire that's a little greasy for me so you can see the difference in the daylight. All right, so we're gonna swap out and do a wide tip. So these are kind of funny. We only put them in hand tight. If I put this together like this, they swell. Excuse me. This is going to swell because it's cold now. Overnight it swells, so now it's super tight and you can't get it off. So we don't go crazy when we put these on. So I love that dry look versus the sort of blotchy, greasy look. It's scary satisfying. Um, you know, to get all that dirt in out of those weird places like that, it's just the best. Uh, I don't know how else to explain it. It's, uh, it's a really fun thing to do. All right, so uh, we hope we've teased you enough. I apologize. Uh, I, I want you to give me all the criticism you want. 
to what you want to see next time. We're going to get into some really cool stuff. Pardon the pun. Can't, it's like you always use that term. Cool. Um, so you're going to see some amazing transformations. You've seen some interesting things. You've learned a little bit about the system, and maybe some of that stuff was like, I don't really care. I just want to see it work. You're going to see it. We're going to do some really, really interesting stuff, wheel wells, underbody, in the next few days. So please tune back in. I can't wait to show you how we're going to transform this car. It's going to be awesome. You're really going to like it, and we're only going to get better at it. So tell your friends. Let people know that this is the only place... There's other people doing this, but they're not going to tell you how to do it. We're going to tell you how to do it. We're going to educate you, and we're going to entertain you, I hope.